welcome to the You've Been Weathered podcast. And today's guest is an actor, writer, producer. Uh, have I missed anything? Loads and loads and loads. Of, an icon. <laughs> and all around, fuck up, really? Yeah. yeah. So, Gal, you must be coming on to nearly 50 years now into this business. Uh, actually, you know what? I started when I was... First professional job on telly was when I was 12. 12? Uh, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, 50 years. 50, I'm 62. Yeah, coming up to 50 years. So, yeah, 50 years in uh, in uh, whatever it's called, show business. So, yeah. I bet you uh, sometimes wake up in the morning and have to pinch yourself really, Gal, to see if you're alive still. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, yeah, I... I'm, you know, you get through it, don't you? I mean, but I, yeah, I'm amazed. I keep watching these documentaries about people like, you know, on TV, like Richard Burton and, and uh, you know, and, and these rocks. And, you know, I'm older than they are when they yeah. died. Like, they were like people that died in their 40s and 50s and, you know, and had problems with drink and drugs and they didn't make it. And uh, But for some strange reason, I pulled through and, uh, and I'm still here. Well, I, I, you know, I've read your book and I'm right. on the guest list and I, and I recommend it to absolutely everybody because, I mean, we all know, we, we do our little films, we do our little bits and pieces and we do whatever we do and that's all we've sort of known for, you know, and people can't really imagine the sort of life that people like yourself, I mean, the, the book was exhausting, Gal. Yeah, I mean, I hope for all the right reasons. It's not. No, I don't think it's a difficult read. I think it's quite easy to read. Um, well, it was written by me, so uh, it's not going to be difficult to read. Um, but what I wanted to do when I got asked to write it, which was uh, which was strange anyway, and I suddenly thought, oh, all right, well, you know, I had a, I was offered uh, offered a publishing deal to write it um, and a deadline. I had a year to write it so I thought I'll start and what I wanted to do was not write it about what an you know an actor's life or um you know a musician's life or a producer's life or I wanted to write what it, what it was like for someone like me to be involved in that life uh and I've always felt like a bit of an outsider you know I always kept waiting for someone to come up and say no we got the wrong Gary Shell you know <laughs> You know, you're, you're supposed to be over there on a building site or cleaning windows, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I always thought that I was a bit of an imposter, you know, so I sort of wrote the book with that in mind of, uh, you know, um, sort of not quite sure when someone was going to come up and say, you know, this ain't for you, gal. You know what I mean? Uh, stick to something else. But uh, no, I managed, you know, and I've managed to carve out some form of career. Well, um, sorry, Gary, carry on. No, no, no. I mean, it's just that. I mean, I think that's what the book, that's why the book, you know, the people I know that have read it and the reviews and that were, were literally that. So and it was like having some bloke in the pub telling you stories, you know, and telling you about what people were like. So, you know, when I'm writing about, you know, people I've worked with and some of the great people I've worked with, and, you know, iconic people that I've actually worked with, you know, it's not about that. It's not about them. It's how they were with me. You know what I mean? How they treated me and, and you know, and, and the, the fun that I had working with these people. And uh, and I think it, it humanised the business a little bit. You know, I try to take strip away that myth that everything is, you know, absolutely fabulous, darling. Yeah. You know, wonderful, you know, and it's not as well, you know. You know, well, you well, can... what amazed me in the book, really, one of, one of the things that absolutely fascinated me is how you sort of, Remember the chronology of the, of the film, well, really. that's the great thing about Google, isn't it? Yeah, no, but I, there's also sort of moments in the book, Gal, which, which are quite sort of, I don't know, not uncomfortable, but just like you can actually feel your fuzziness, you know? And, and I was thinking, how did he remember this? How did he remember this? How, I mean, obviously, with all the uh, uh, the alcohol and the, and, the, and the other stuff that you sort of got involved with and everything, it was it's a, it's a testament to you, really, Gary. And I mean, the point of what you've just said about 
someone coming and tap you on the shoulder. Michael Caine said that in his book, you know. Oh, did he? Yeah, he, he, he said, you know, when he, when he first got the uh, Harry Palmer uh, film, yeah, he, he all of a sudden got on a contract for 10 grand a week. Yeah, yeah. a lot of money in 1967. Right, yeah. right. And, 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 and uh, he was so used to being living in poverty. Yeah. That he said the first thing he went out and done is just bought shirts and toothpaste and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what he means. I remember the first time, you know, I started earning some money. I went out and bought, like, bedding. Yeah. You know, and, you know, matching, you know, I started matching things and not relying on hand-me-downs and, and stuff like that. It's quite incredible what, what, what it, what, you know what money means to people like us you know yeah. it's like, i remember that when the when the, the national lottery first started and i remember some bloke in derby won about nine million quid and it was one of the first big wins and they said to him you know so you you've won nine million quid what's the first thing you're going to do with that and he said i'm going to take my entire family out to a bernie inn <laughs> And I thought someone should tell him he could buy the fucking chain. He could buy it, yeah. He could buy Bernie in, but you know it's that thing about you know I had no idea. I mean, I still to this day I'm rubbish with money. As, yes, you know, I can see that in the book as well. It's a very uh, you 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 don't hold any sort of regard for money at all, really. If none you, whatsoever. If you if you get sixteen hundred, like an incident in your book where you was, uh, I think. Lindsay, you, you and Lindsay are just parted company. Yeah. And for the first time in your life, you had to go to the, the social security to yeah. uh, try and find some rent or whatever, you know, and, and the uh, <laughs> and the check come through the door, the 1,600 quid, uh, 1600 quid check come through the door you give 600 quid to the landlord and went out and bought two guitars <laughs> yeah, yeah that's absolutely you know I, was, I mean you know I am a match I've always been rubbish you know rubbish with money I remember um when I was um you know when I'd stopped acting in the in the yeah. late 80s and I went into um into uh, writing music professionally for like tv commercials and things like that and you've got a thing called prs which is like performance rights society which where you get your royalties yeah and i'd written i'd written the music for um uh um some adverts for curry's warehouse and pc world and things like that and they'd been running for about six months uh you know on the telly all the time and uh one day i've got a, a prs uh letter through the door and i opened it and there's a check in it and uh, it, it was 1,200 quid. And I thought, oh, that's nice. And I was earning a few quid. So I put it in my pocket. I thought, next time I'm near the bank, I'll put it in the bank. 1,200 quid. That'll buy me another guitar, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I put, so you know, cool. So I put it in my pocket. And it was there for about a month. Yeah. And then one day I put, you know, that was earning money. So like 1,200 quid. Anyway, one day I put my jacket on. And I'm, what's that? Oh, God, it's that 1,200 quid check. <laughs> So I went up the bank in Oxford Street up to Nat West and I went in and I said, uh, I'd like to bank this check for 1,200 quid. And uh, the girl looked at him and she went, 12,000 quid, you yeah. mean? And I went, I'm sorry? <laughs> she went, it's 12,000 quid for like a 30-second jingle I'd written. I was like, what? Yeah. And I'd been walking around with 12 grand in my pocket and didn't even know. But, but you know, it was like, it was like, you mean I've spent all my life trying to get a record deal I spent all my life trying to get, you know, people take my music seriously. I write 30 seconds of rubbish for a TV commercial and you get paid that amount of money. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. God, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I mean, do you think <clears throat> that your, your, your lack of respect for money come from sort of getting involved in, in, in the arts at an early age, really, Gary? Because it, it, it looks to me that from from the age of 13 up until i suppose five or six years ago it was all pretty surreal really it, it all seems like you know look how, how did you how did you get involved in it what 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 time can you pinpoint where the sort of 
creative buzz got into it with your parents? Were they yeah, supportive, yeah, totally. you know, and It's always been, you know, in my family, there's, music is the thing, really. It's always been there. And it's uh, my mum and dad, you know, always playing music. You know, the first thing I can remember is like, you know, Chubby Checker and Elvis. I mean, you know, a lot of people have got the same story. It's like, you know, my mum and dad always had parties. They were always very sociable. Um, and, you know, music, right from an early age, I can't remember what it was like. You know, my mum has always had the radio on. She was always singing. My dad played guitar. My granddad played banjo. And, and on Sunday afternoons, when everyone came over, it was like a jam session in my yeah. house. You know, so, so, you know, I wanted to play the piano. I, I mean, I think I heard my dad bought me Chantilly Lace by the well, big don't forget, Don't forget the Boys Brigade story. In this. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I mean, I was in the Boys Brigade, but I'd, I'd started learning to, to play music before that. Um, and it was like every time, I, you know, a new instrument. I mean, my dad played me Jerry Lee Lewis and, and, and people like that. And I just wanted to know how to play that on the piano. I didn't particularly want to play the piano. I just wanted to be able to play that on the piano so uh, dad bought a piano uh and we i started getting lessons and, I, and um it became pretty obvious quite early on that i wasn't going to be like you know a classical pianist and because all i wanted to do was play songs that people knew a and b and yeah i wanted to be able to play you know so my teacher angela she was fantastic and she so they went out and bought me a my dad bought me um the best of burt Bacharach. You know, all those great songs, you know, raindrops keep yeah. falling on the head and all that and, and bought me the book. And and be, and I never got the hang of reading music. So what I used to do is I'd get Angela to play it on the piano and, and I would watch what she played. And then I had this uncanny knack of being able to just pick it up. So I've always been able to just pick up an instrument and get a tune out of it. Um, so I played piano for like four or five years uh you know learning and then i thought i've had enough of that and i wanted to learn something else and then i discovered reggae and bob marley well i was going to go into that i think you've got a lot of uh you know your your friend milton oh yeah bless him. deserves a big shout really doesn't he to 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 awaken well, yeah, I mean, you know, as I say, I was so lucky. I was surrounded by music. And, like, obviously at my house, you know, it, we had, like, everything from Herb Alpert to Glenn Campbell, uh, the Beach Boys. Uh, and then when I went round to my mate's house, Milton, his mum and dad had just come, you know, a, a, a flown in from Jamaica in the late 50s. And all we had round there was, like, uh, ska music and reggae and Jim Reeves. Wow. Funny, a lot of Jamaican wow. people love Jim Reeves. Wow. And I didn't know that. And so so we had, I had a kind of an education of music no matter where I came from. So around 1972, 73, when the, the first Bob Marley albums hit the shores, you know, we were there. Uh, you know, on every Saturday, we were down on the 113 bus down to Oxford Street to a daddy call to pick up like yeah. all the pre releases. You know, and, and that was it. It was like, you know, parties were, you know, we didn't have record players. We had sound systems. Yeah, I remember. You yeah. know, you remember that blues yeah. and things like that. And so I was listening to like heavy dub music and Augustus Pablo and all those Jamaican artists and Big Youth and I Ray and all that mm. from a really early age, you know, yeah. and it just stuck with me. Well, the thing is that, that also struck me. Because it, it was quite similar to, to my life as well, Gary. You know that obviously we it's the comprehensive sort of nineteen seventy years or whatever. And if you show any sort of signs of being creative or or any signs of wanting to go that way, there was there wasn't really a lot of roads for you to go down. And and why I'm envious of you, and I really I I, I, I mean. My God, it, 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 was, it, it must have just been such a gift to have them teachers in your school, Gary, that actually looked at you and just thought, no, you know, there's potential there. There's a bit of potential here and we'll guide this, you know? Yeah, without the, you know, I know and that was Marcus Kimber and... Um, East, and uh, East, uh, yeah, Easterfield, Trevor, yeah. Trevor Easterfield, both yeah. of them. They were like, you know, uh, they took it on themselves. I mean, you know, uh, Trevor Easterfield was my music teacher and he was terrifying. You know, he was a terrifying geezer. And, um, but I was playing drums then. I was play I'd played, like mentioned earlier, I joined the Boys Brigade, you know, so I could uh, 
learn driving everyone drive. mad on a Sunday. I oh, played yeah. the golf course. Yeah, but then again, I you know, you say I'm driving them mad, but the, the you know, it, it was like for me, they it loved was, it. They loved I thought they did anyway. You know, I was giving it all the old, <laughs> giving it, the <laughs> thing, throwing what them was up. It? Yeah, what was it? <laughs> yeah, the two, three. <laughs> You know, I loved it. Um, and Dad bought me a snare drum so I could practice. But so I was playing drums, like, you know, from the age of 11. Um, and then Trevor Easterfield, he used to play the old Hammond electric organ for, like, uh, weekend parties, you know, like for nice. mitzvahs and weddings and things. Uh, and he asked me if I'd go with him and play drums. Wow. So my music teacher, I was playing professionally and earning a few quid when I was 12. Wow. Um, so he saw that I had, you know, a form of musical ability. And uh, and the other guy, Marcus Kimber, who, um, yeah, I'll tell you a little story about him. You remember the young ones? Yes. Like, and all that. Would you know the little puppets in it? Yes. The, uh, like, you know, S uh, SPG, yes. the little the rat. And all, and all that, yeah. Well, the guy who made those puppets and worked those puppets was Marcus Kimber, who was oh. my drama teacher at school. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, so I know. Did you ever run into him again then uh, uh... Because uh, you was around Rick and all them, wasn't you? With yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I mean, I worked with Rick uh, in early 1981, I think. And we did a film together called Shock Treatment. Um, and we used to sort of meet each other at parties. And he, him and Aid Edmondson came up to... I was at the, uh, at the King's Head uh, in Islington, the theatre pub in Islington. I think it's the King's Head or the King's Arms. Uh, and I was sat there one night. And, and at that time, uh, the young ones was huge. And I'd worked with Rick, uh, but I'd never met Aid, Aid Edmondson. Anyway, I'm was sitting in the pub and I'd been to see this play. And it was, I think it was half time and I was in the pub having a pint. And Rick and Aid came over and he introduced me to Aid. And Aid said, uh, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, well, I think I would. Yeah. You know, I think I would. He said, no, you wouldn't remember me. He said, I had really long hair. He said, but when you were at Manchester University Theatre... He said, I was doing the drama course and we came to meet you after a show one day. Wow. And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And Rick Rick said, oh, so you two know each other? And I was like, no, you know. But after that, we used to see each other at parties a lot yeah. and all that. So, uh, but, you know, so so I I never really sort of, um, sort of, what's the word? I never stayed in touch with people like Marcus. And and I, st I speak to Trevor now. He's in his 90s. I think, wow. you know, late 80s, early 90s now. And I speak to him on Facebook every now and then. But, but, if, but those two blokes, if it wasn't for them, then there's no way I would have left that, you know, the comprehensive system. They, they got me the audition. They came to talk to my mum and dad. They said it was feasible if I could get a grant, you know, because we couldn't have afforded to send me to that school. Uh, and we filled all the forms in. We did everything. Uh, I went and auditioned. I played, I think I played Rock Around the Clock and Blue Moon on the piano for them. Um, and, and I got in, you know, I mean, Christ, I mean, that was just like something else, you know, like the whole street knew about it, you know. Yeah. Like, and I, I mean, was the first thing to go, what's that, you're gone? I mean, the, 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 the question that I wanted to ask, really, which takes, it just takes you back a little bit as well. I mean, that point, I mean, I can't, I can't stop, keep coming back, because when I read your book, the, the opportunities, like the uh, the opportunistic way that these opportunities have come to you through life, it it didn't. I don't know if it's just because it's the book and it's and and there's a lot of subtext that you have to sort of try and grasp from books and whatever. It seemed to be fluid it, your whole life, you know. Yeah, you, you took a step and then and then that step. It wasn't a premeditated step. It was just this step that took you somewhere else. I mean, from school into the arts ed system that you'd done. You know, how did you, how did, what was your feelings coming from that sort of obvious regimented uh, system into this carefree creative system, you know? It's, um, it's it, yeah, I mean, it is an interesting thing because I mean, I said in the book, really, you know, the first day at school, I just, I always looked at it, again, as an outsider. I always thought, you know, I'm not part of this. This isn't my world. Wow. But I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you know, when you get invited, you know, you know what it's like. 
when you're an actor or when you're, you know, um, you know, or you're well known per se, you know, you're they call you a celebrity or whatever, you get invited to some right strange places and you meet some really weird and wonderful people. If you if you act like you're part of that, if you act like you are one of them, you run that risk of being a real twat. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? So I've always tried to just be who I am. Yeah. And and the thing is, but I was lucky because like in the early, early 70s, there weren't many actors that spoke like I was. Yes. You know, all cockneys were like, like, you know, uh, you know, hello, me old matey, fruit me matey. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tug me old fool lock. It was all a bit like that. And so I got auditioned, you know, suddenly it became vogue to use the real thing. Of and course. a bit later on, you had the Anna Share school system where yes. people like Phil Daniels came from and Pauline Quirk. But until, you know, but before that, there wasn't any of us. And all of a sudden, because of the Labour government, um, people like me from a working class background suddenly found themselves in private schools. You know what I mean? So we were a bit of a novelty. So I was never treated like an outsider. I was never made to feel stupid. I was actually quite a novelty. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it was almost like being put into a position of, of being in the spotlight rather than feeling like I have to catch up. And when did that turn, you reckon? Because sort of 1964, you know, when you and the Pinter come along and then you had Osborne, then you had Joe Alton, <coughs> then you had the Beatles, then you had Michael Caine. And it, and it, was, quite, it was quite kudos to be sort of working class especially with the middle class women and things like that. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I mean, that's you know, what, yeah. Yeah, I so mean, did it, did it stop and start again? Because, I mean, I didn't, I, I grew up not like you, you know. I grew up in the, in the working class environment right up until I was sort of, 28, 29, you know, I yeah. didn't have that at sort of 13 and 14 where you could actually see the difference. I didn't know that life that you were living, even it even existed, you know, I, I didn't know. I, and that's what fascinated me again in the book, because the parallel lines between us took to me when I was 28, but took to you when you was 13, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was a ridiculously early time to start. Um, and, and it, you know, I think, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, in the book, I, I talk about things, you know, cause and effect, you know, I mean, the reason I ended up meeting Mark Kimber, uh, uh, you know, the drama teacher at Hendon Junior High School is because I was on detention. Yeah. Wearing green socks. Uh, you know, you weren't allowed to wear green socks. Uh, so I was on detention. And that's how I met Mark Kimber, who was taking the detention. He got me to read the part of Tom Sawyer. I got the lead part in the school play. That then impressed him. That got him to... Do you see what I mean? That's how it yeah. works. Uh, well, and that's, forget, how my life, that's, but that's how my life works. Don't forget the Dung Beetle. Oh, God, yeah. yeah, yeah that's How it. did you prepare for the Dung Beetle? Oh, yeah, I spent hours, you know, you know <laughs> hours in the bushes going, yeah. No, oh, you just don't, do you? You just don't. Oh, I'm joking. You know. I'm I know, but that. it's like, you know, I've always thought, you know, you go with the flow. Yeah. You know, if someone says that's good, don't question it. Keep doing it. You know, um, and it's and it has. It's been like that. I mean, you know, quadrophenia came completely out of the blue. But if I hadn't gone on stage, you know, in my final year at drama school with green hair, you know, on the I was doing playing Captain Solioni from Three Sisters, which has got to be singularly one of the most boring, boring plays, plays on the planet. Yeah. So on the last night. I thought, you know, they can't, they can't chuck me out. I'm leaving, so I went on in a Russian uniform, but I did it with green hair. Really. And when I came off, some uh, bird came up to me. You know, was, was she was sat with my mum and dad, and she said, "Hello, my name is uh, Sharon Hampton. You know, I'm an agent. I think what you did was absolutely uh, terrible, but <laughs> brilliantly funny." Yeah. And she said, uh, "She said, you know, come and see me on Monday." Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, maybe uh, me being your agent. So on the Monday, yeah. I went down to Soho, went to her office. And while I was there, she said, have you ever, have you ever heard of a band called The Who? And I was like, well, yeah, a bit old, aren't they? I think my mum and dad like them. Uh, and, she, and that was it. I went for an audition for Quadrophenia. So my first job leaving drama school was Quadrophenia. 
Wow. In retrospect, that's huge, isn't it? That's a really, really huge thing. But I read some bits and pieces about Quadrophenia, about the audition process of Quadrophenia, you know, and how they got people there. It was really quite off the cuff, wasn't it, Gary? Well, mine certainly was. I ended up having a fight with, with the director. Um, you know, I mean, seriously, yeah. you know, he, he um, you know, they got me along for it and uh, I went in and he basically dismissed me as looking too weedy and soft to be in his, in his, uh, in his gang, you know, so I offered him out and I said, go on and give me a slap, go on, see if you can get anywhere near me and he, he went to it. I mean, he tells his story a lot, you know, and he said, you know, and, and I waited for him to take a swing. And I just did a double backflip and landed in a kind of Bruce Lee way. <laughs> and he was so shocked. And he offered me the part. And that was it. Really? You know, and, you know, and they changed the name of the role because you, originally the part was for a guy called uh, Finger. And, and, you know, Finger. Or the, well, fuck that. Uh, and he changed the name to Spider. Brilliant. Because yeah. uh, he thought that's what I looked like. So, uh, and, but and yeah, but that. What's that? Uh, go on, Gary. Carry on. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, but again, it's that whole thing of, of, you know, he could have said to me, you know, I don't think you're right for this. And I could have said, oh, all right, then and left. You know, but I didn't. You know, you've got to follow it through. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. And I th was there thousands and thousands of people going up for that gig, Gary? Yeah, that do you know what? I don't really was it know. sort of agent? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of bollocks about it. Uh, uh, you know, they the some newspaper ran a, a kind of story, which was, do you want to be a star? You know, and I think hundreds of people, you know, answered that kind of call, you know, you know, every, anyone can be a star. But Frank wasn't stupid. I mean, that was all just pre-publicity, really. Yeah. Um, he knew who he wanted. And it, it, you know, once he'd met, you know, I think Toya really had to fight hard. To yeah. get that film she fought really hard but you know the rest of us once frank saw what he could see i mean and, and the funny thing was he, i didn't meet anyone until the first day we, we, we all went up to uh, lee wembley and we were all we all met each other for the first time and that and that was an interesting thing because what frank did is that we didn't you know know what it's like you know when we do, we've just finished a film haven't we like well yeah. two years ago now it's coming out next week but you know um we all knew Ray, you know, uh, the, the, the director from years. And, you know, we all knew each other for, you know, the toys in it and Trevor and all that. So so there's none of that having to get to know you. So we could have met each other, done the read-through and started filming the following day. Yes. The thing about Quadrophenia, what Frank did, which was just so brilliant, and you just can't do that anymore, I don't think. The budget won't allow it. But what he did is once he got his core, his core cast together, he gave us a month before we even, you know, started even looking at the script. And in that month, we all, we all went to pubs and we all went to clubs and we all went to see bands and we all went to each other's houses and stayed over and we had parties. So by the time we started filming, we knew each other. And when you're that young, you know That's how different. You, you, you build a relationship with people. Uh, and so by the time we started filming, we were already taking the piss out of each other. And we yeah. always, you know... We'd met each other's mothers. Yeah, we knew, wow. you know, Mark, you know, Mark Winger, you know, one of my oldest mates, he was living in my house. Yeah. You know, we had bunk beds and he was, you know, when we were filming Quadrophenia, he was actually living at my house. So, so, you know, we had that kind of teenage life and we were a real little gang. We were really protective yeah. of each other. And it's still the same today when we all get together. It's quite incredible. You know, we, you know, we actually still, you know, we've known each other for so long now. You know that we can finish each other other sentences and things like that. So, I think that was something that, and that's one of the reasons what makes that film so special. Yeah, because you know, yeah. it doesn't look like we're acting. No, I know. I, I remember we did a play up in Edinburgh about 1994, based on a book written by uh, a so-called member of the uh, Cray Gang, right? Like a guy called. Uh, Tony Lambriano. I know Tony Lambriano, yeah. Well, I don't know him, but I, I've met, I have met Tony Lambriano. Yeah, and uh, he wrote a book called Inside the Firm. So the, the, the director, John Ivey, put 
put us all together. And but like you, we were together sort of three weeks before yeah. we went to Edinburgh. And then we went to Edinburgh, and not unlike your uh, situation when you done the uh, when you played Fat Pig, you know the Fat Pig yeah. thing that you took up there. We was in this most amazing uh, digs accommodation, and we had two weeks before the play actually started. So we had three weeks together back in London where we'd all meet each other and then two weeks actually in Edinburgh just yeah so by the time we'd done that show it, it, we, like you we had a month together just I mean five complete pot asses, you know we were <laughs> absolute <laughs> lunatics and we decided when we went up to Edinburgh to uh Stay in character, so we <laughs> in the cage. Yeah. We used to walk about in sixty suits all around Edinburgh just to stay in that character, which didn't hurt the the publicity. But yeah, well, no, handing does. out leaflets to the yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I played a guitar in a scene. It's a very parallel, like. But I won't get onto me too much now. But it's yeah, just, go on. Like, and I remember that GMTV. I mean, there was a parallel story in this film about rent boys. Okay, so and 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 there's a scene in it where I come out with a guitar and play this little tune, which is quite which was quite naughty, really, sort of boys in alleyways sort of things. And and, and GMTV came down and uh, to, to do one of them early morning things. I think it was being shown about six o'clock in the morning or something. So the director said, right, take the guitar, go down there and just do the song. And, and these two, us, Ronnie and Reggie, are just stand behind you. Anyway, I'm doing this song and the, the, the guy, the presenter, can't be, went, oh, he said, that's a bit heavy, isn't it? That's a bit heavy. <laughs> oh, six six in the morning. <laughs> but anyway, cut to, Gary, Quadrophenia. <laughs> you're making Quadrophenia. You've done Quadrophenia. Did you know you had a film? What, uh, what, the quadrophenia? Yeah, did you know at the end of that you had a film? Um, no, not really. Really? Not really. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, after that, I didn't really, really take much interest in it until about 1997. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was like my first job. After that, it was theatre for me. You know, I was on, I went on the theatre trail, you know, um, went, I went on an Oxford Playhouse tour the Young Vic, uh, Manchester University. Um, and I was just doing theatre um, up until up until Metal Mickey. Uh, and then I was on national television. Um, you know, well, the Johnny and, Jarvis thing is the oh, thing yeah, I no, that, to uh, talk to you about, really, because that goes further than, than sort of acting, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that was just amazing. You know, it's, I still look back on that. And can you, can you tell people about... The production, Gary. What, what 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 the actual sort of content was about? What uh, Johnny Jarvis? Yes. Yeah, I mean it was set in you know the early eighties when we filmed it, um, and it's about you know Thatcher's Britain, um, you know, and what it was like to be on the dole, and 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 also what it was like um, to be living like like homelessness. It was about homelessness and people living in you know uh, accommodation run by the church. Wow. Uh, there was so many different, but it, but the whole thread was hung on to this guy called Johnny Jarvis, who who was always trying to do the right thing, do the right thing by people. You know what I mean? He tried being a skinhead, he tried being a fascist, but that didn't work. So then he's, you know, then he gets a bird pregnant, so he's got to get a job, but he has to go away to work, you know, and send the money back. He's always doing the right thing, and his best mate, who's a bit of a weedy. Uh, you know, in fact, he was like regarded as the school joke. You know, at, uh, Lipton in the in the, in the in the show. Um, he actually writes songs. He's a songwriter, and everyone says, you know, that you're not going to make anything out of that. You know, why are you writing that? You've got to get a job like Johnny Jarvis. You've got to be like Johnny. And he's writing songs, and the songs he writes are about Johnny. Right. So he's writing all these songs about yeah. what it's like to be an out of work or to do the right thing and all that. And his songs become really successful. And he's the one that becomes rich. Brilliant. And then he then takes Johnny into his kind of world. And he's completely like a fish out of water. 
you know, it, this guy worked in a lathe factory. And suddenly he's around this beautiful pad in, you know, northwest London, surrounded by musicians smoking weed, you know, and he just doesn't get it at all. So, so that's basically what it's about. And it's about, you know, how you can work, you can work your bollocks off and you can do this and never make anything of yourself. And yet someone else can write about what you're doing and become a success. So then let's take that back to the audition. After you've done the audition and you meet, I mean, you, you your audition, the character you read for wasn't you, was it? The first no, character. not at all. Like, um, no, no. And you actually stopped. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, where's the story go to there that ending up the sort of Ivan Novello award, Gary? Well, I mean, you know, again, again, that whole thing of following something through and, and something that happened completely out of the blue. I went for the audition. It was Nigel Williams had written it, and I'd done a play at the at, at the Oxford Playhouse, and then went on to the Young Vic called Class Enemy, which was like a really heavy play about uh, you know school kids again the educational system, and um, I was playing a right little little toe rag uh, called Nipper, and I did it as a punk rocker. It yes. wasn't written for a punk rocker, but at that point, it, punk rock was really big, and it was. And I think it was one of the first times ever you'd seen a punk rocker on stage. Tell you, yeah. Um, so I'd done that play. And during that time, I was in a band. I had a little band. And what we did is at the end of the, the Young Vic run, we had a party and I got my band to play. So Nigel Williams. Is the that the Joe McGann band? Yeah, me, me and Joe McGann. And a guy called David John, who's also an actor. Um, anyway, we played at the party and Nigel Williams obviously was there. So when I went for this audition, the director is a great director called Alan Dossa, who was uh, one of the original directors at the, at the Liverpool Everyman. Wow. You know, one of, and he's like one of Willie Russell's boys, yeah. you know, the, you know really top, top geezer, yeah. theatre director. Anyway, he was directing this and I turn up for the audition and it was to play the part of Manning, who was like a real hard skinhead, real racist. And I read, and, and that, obviously I went in and Nigel went, hello, Gary, lovely to see you again, you know, and this is Alan, you know, anyway, if you'd like to read this. So I'm looking at it and I just, I read about three lines and I just went, nah, I said, I'm not right for this. And they were, and Alan Dossa went, God, fuck me. An, an honest actor. He goes, <laughs> oh, he goes, we could have wasted half, I said, yeah, I could have wasted half an hour of my life doing that. Yeah. So, Nigel then said, oh, well, we've got 20 minutes to have a cup of tea. So we're having a cup of tea and we're just chatting, just chatting. And I was asking Alan, you know, questions about what it was like to direct at the Everyman in the glory days, you know, with, with all those, like Pete Postle, Thwaite, oh, and all those yeah, guys, legends. And then Nigel turned around and said, how's the band? How's the, how's the music going? I went, yeah, yeah, it's all going, going well. I said, I'm writing for this. I've been writing a bit of music for that. And Alan Dossa turned around and said, what, you're a musician? I went, yeah. He said, what, do you play? I said, yeah. And Nigel went, he's a bass player. I said, well, I can play other things, but yeah, I play bass in the band. And uh, so then Nigel says, uh, so Alan says, hang on a minute, episode three, right? Episode three, and he goes through the scripts. He goes, there's a part for this geezer who's in a rock band. Do you want to read for that? So I went, yeah, go on then. So get third script out and i'm reading it and suddenly i'm seeing me yeah. on the page so now i became this guy called guy reigns who's a real yeah. narcissist very kind of you know he's gay but he won't admit it but he's definitely gay and i wanted to play it you, he's never said that in the in the show not once do you as, as it mentioned that he's gay but i'm playing it like he is but he doesn't want people to know and I said that, I said, I think this guy's gay. And they go, and Nigel went, you are, you are bang on the money, right? So then, and this is where it gets really good. He, right. said, like, he, said, he goes, he goes, he goes, I don't suppose you'd fancy having a go at writing the theme music. And oh, I went, are you joking? He went, no. I said, when do you want it? And I'm being flash now, you know, yeah. I'm being like, yeah, I can do that. So he goes, all right. I said, okay, find a piano. And we're in the BBC centre, the one down in White City. So I've gone downstairs with the script and I've opened it up and, and one of the first lines was uh, Johnny gets a gyro Monday morning. Um, and I just sat at the piano and I wrote Johnny Jarvis, the music. 
the, for the theme. Anyway, they all come down. He phones the producer, who then comes down, and I played it to them. And that was it. So I get the part, but I also get the contract to write all the music wow. and the songs for, uh, for the show. I was 23. Unbelievable, man. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And, it, and also a lot of pressure. You know, a lot of pressure. And I found Yeah, up, but again, it's like I said to you, really. I mean, again, through reading the book, it doesn't, nothing seems to, I mean, unless it's sort of outside of your everyday life or your, your, your mission when you put your feet down on the floor after getting out of bed in the morning and just following one foot or the other, everything yeah. seems to, seems to be seamless, you know, but it like you go for an place. audition. Yeah, you, yeah, um, but... you, you stop the audition. Oh, this is not me. Fantastic. What about this? What about this? What <laughs> you're writing the theme tune to the I know, I know. I, yeah, but it, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't I can't say what it would have been like had I not said that. Yeah, had but I if you was a wanker actor, oh, yeah, yeah, right, but don't forget you would never be in that position, you know. If you no, were one know. of them wanker actors, you know, who, who who go to their part and they don't I mean that's a testament to you, mate, for you know, I don't know how to label that really. I mean that sort of freedom and that sort of I don't know if it's crazy or or it or, or, or is it sort of spiritual, you know? Well, do you know what it is? I, it, it's it's this whole thing of not being able, not making, I, I don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to look like a fool, right? I do enough of that in my private life. You know what I mean? I look, I'm such an idiot. I've done stuff that I'm really not proud about. I've fucked up relationships. I've lost money. I've, you know, lost houses. I, all that shit, right? But when it comes to the work, when it comes to my work, I don't want to look like a twat. Yeah. Right. You know, I, 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 because I, you know, and that, and that's probably one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of me out there. Right. You know, the, the work that I do, I'm really careful about, you know, what I want to do. And I, I you know, even with Quadrophenia, you know, I was watching everybody and I'm, you know, playing that kind of role of a youngster who's trying to be big like the rest of them. You know, it, that, that, that was hard to do, you know, because it, it, it to try and make that look natural. You know, to try and make yourself look like the butt of the joke and all that, and yet and yet still be lovable with it and things like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of thought gone, gone into the work that I do, and people don't realise that. Yeah. So I, I don't want to look like a twat. Uh, I'll give you an example. Someone sent me a script uh, a week ago, uh, a new pilot for a TV show, and it's a comedy. And I'm reading it, and it's obviously for a guy who's a scouser. Right. right, you know, it's a real scousing, and the guy who wrote it lives on the Wirral, right? So, you know, it's a scousing, and they wanted me to play the lead role. And anyway, I spoke to the producer and I said, I'm gonna pass on it. And he said, I said, I think it's really good and very funny. I said, But it's you need a Liverpudlian actor for this, yeah, of course, of right? Course. Because I can do you know, I can eager, it's like, you know, yeah. fucking hell, like, you know, I, I can do the accent if it's a joke, if I'm gonna do a joke, yeah, but if I'm gonna carry a show. Right. I, you know, I can't I don't want to leave, leave myself open to that. You know, why is he doing that crappy accent? You know, yeah. I don't want to. It's not it's not in my comfort zone. Yeah. So I said to him, I gave him that and he said, oh, all right. And anyway, they, they got back in touch with me and they said, uh, we spoke to the writer and they said, uh, you know, if you're still interested, we'll 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 set it wherever you want. Wow. Right now, whether or not I still do that is, is yeah. neither here nor there. If I'd gone along with it and said, yeah. yes, I can do a Liverpool accent, I'd yeah. be under so much pressure, I understand. you know, to do that. And I just, I don't need that kind of pressure in my life. You know? I understand. I went up for a, an episode once of uh, A Touch of Frost. Do you know that programme? Yeah, of course. And uh, I was sitting outside talking to a couple of Northerners, you know, that, was, that, were, that were at the audition as well. Anyway, I went in and read the script. And afterwards, the director said to me, now, can you do it in a northern accent, right? You know what this is like, sitting there and want you to turn on a northern accent. I, I said, know. well, no, not really, I can't. He went, what do you mean you can't? You can't, you're an actor. And I went, well, you know, I can't. Why would you want me to do this in a northern accent when you've got two northerners sitting outside waiting Absolutely. to come in and, and read it? You know, I said, yeah. if you ever... If you want a Northern actor, why don't you get one? 
Do you want me to sound like Liam Gallagher? I'll do that for you now. You know, I'll sit here and go fucking mouth for it and all that. But, but that's not an urban accent. No, no it's a caricature. So that's good, that sort of truth, isn't it? Well, so, I, you know, I don't want to look like an idiot. And, and the thing is, you know, I, I like I say, you know, I, if you want me to be an idiot, just, you know, I'll meet you anywhere, you know, and you can see for yourself. Yes, but, I know. Well, yeah. As well, you know. Yeah, no, uh, but, well, I know. I mean, I found it very, uh, you know, when you're doing these podcast things, you know, I know it's out there to write, uh, to read or whatever, all your story and everything, but there's, you know, there was painful aspects on that. I mean, when you and Lindsay broke up, your, your wife, Lindsay, how you described that, how you felt at that moment, I think you say you cried like a baby, you know? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. I th you know, how I recognise that sort of, uh, them sort of words is that we cry for ourselves, really, don't we? We don't cry yeah. for anything, no situation, no nothing. We just think, fucked it again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Damn I mean, you know, I gave her no choice. I mean, you know... It's like if that's the thing you see. If she if she'd stayed after the amount of pain I'd caused her, then I wouldn't have had any respect. Yes. You know what I mean? I don't respect women that do that. And it's it's like she tried everything, you know. And it, and it's you know it, and you know we're still friends. I mean, you know, it's been a long time now, and she's remarried, and she's very happy, and 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 but she holds no animosity against. You know, well, you can see that she was really in love with you, mate. Yeah, and 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 I was too. And we did the whole wedding, and we did everything else, and it's all great. And for four years, but during that four years, I was going through absolute torment, you know. And try, I didn't know, you know. That's the thing about alcoholism; you don't know, you know. Uh, and it's like I've got these three questions now. I ask people when someone says to me. You know, I think I'm an alcoholic. I can ask you three questions, and after the first question, I can pretty much tell you if you are or you're not. And the thing is, I didn't know that then. I didn't yeah. know that. You know, I didn't know that it wasn't okay to drink a large scotch at six in the morning. I didn't know that. And I was still being successful. You know, I was turning up on set and having a large brandy at four o'clock in the morning yeah. with one of the stuntmen. I didn't know that, that that was unreasonable behavior. I didn't know that. Um, and it was years and years and years and years where I, you know, or and I was you, still being... you knew that, you knew it really, but you wasn't really aware that it was wrong. But it didn't affect my life. Yeah. You know, when you say, you know, it, you know, it's like, you know, do not work with, you know, with heavy machinery. Yeah. You know, I didn't have to drive. Yeah. I didn't have to yeah. drive a tank. I didn't have yeah. to shoot a gun. I didn't yeah. have to stay sober if I didn't want to, yeah. you know, and, and it was like, and I didn't want to, you yeah. know, and I think that's the other thing about the book, you know, when, you know, when you meet people that, you know, have given up drinking and they say things like, you know, oh, God, the bad old days, you know, God, but they weren't bad, right. I had a brilliant time, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, how about the, uh, how about your stag do? Oh, don't, man, that's like, <laughs> Legendary. Ah, I was yeah. laughing you know, with your father and your father in law standing yeah. there, and you trying to be completely sort of sane and just. <laughs> and, and, do you know what? There are still survivors from that, right? That still talk about that. I mean, it's like, you know, people were waiting. I visualized it like the Last Supper. I visualized it <laughs> like a table raise. And you was like a Game of Thrones character, oh. just sort of lording over this yeah, debauchery, yeah. this debauchery that was yeah. going on all around you. Oh, it was like Caligula. It was like a night round <laughs> Caligula's house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was a classic reading. Fuck you know. And I'm not joking, right? At the actual wedding, people were getting saying to my dad and my father-in-law at the time, right, bless him. And, and it was one of those things where we all looked at each other and said, no one ever speaks <laughs> about this ever again. <laughs> ever. The geezer's the geezer's daughter's marrying you under yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that and that and it was like this. So like, you know, all the women are going, you know, so how was Gary Stag night? And they were all going, it was, it was very, right. it was very nice. We had a buffet and <laughs> they were lying like fuckers, right? 
And it was like, we kept that secret until the book came out. Yeah, oh, like, you amazing, know, amazing. Right, now, I mean, like, the trouble, as I said before, with talking to you, you've got so much that I would love people to know about you, which they obviously don't know about you unless they, they sort of read this book, you know, Gary. You're not Spider out of Quadrophenia. You're not Metal Mickey, the kid who played Metal Mickey. You're not any anybody other than yourself. And there's a lot of attributes that sort of go together to make a person, you know, what people see on the screen is nowhere near it. So I'd really do urge people to go out and buy Gary's book. You know, yeah, I'm still you, on the gas copy, just I mean, for a read, not 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 because to 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 make you out to be some sort of superhero or to. Or, no. or, I got the same feeling when I read Michael Caine's book. Uh, What's it all about? Hmm. I got that same truthful feeling from it. You know that there's nothing better than the person uh, who the book who the book's about actually writing the book. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've read a few biographies and after the first three pages, you know, it wasn't written by that person. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they're all right. If, if it's just it's just that thing. I always thought I'm not I'm not a writer. I don't pretend to be. And I thought I'm going to have one crack. Well, at you ain't bit. done too bad, mate. No, I don't think I did too badly. But and, and I enjoyed it. I did enjoy the, the process. Uh, and I have been asked to write, you know, more. And, and, and to be honest, it's bloody hard work. You know, and I'd rather concentrate on something that I know I can do uh, rather than try and follow it up. And someone said, Was it a painful process, Gary, or a cathartic process? It was very cathartic. It, it, very cathartic. There were a couple of times when I shed a tear and I was like, yeah. I had to remember things. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, what can I say? Uh, you know, it, did you actually at points just cut your head and think, oh, I did not do that? Yeah, um, yeah, there were a few like that. But then again, I tried to add a little bit of humour in it. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, it's not all bad. You know, it's like that whole thing about, you know, you the way you look at the story, it's like if you wake up in a skip after a party, right, in the King's Road in the middle of the daytime, right, That's still okay. dressed in top hat and tails, right, it depends how you tell that story. Yeah. Right? If you tell that story like, oh, God, oh, God. You know, it can be like, oh, that's terrible. But if you actually say, you know, I just wish I'd had a monocle and that would have set off the entire outfit. You know what I mean? You can make it a bit funny and, and, and look, take the edge off it. It's not all bad. And the thing is, I'm still alive. Yes. You know, I did God find knows it. How. No, God, God knows, knows how. how. But, but I mean, that, that, like a great example of what you're saying there was when you was mangled up in that car on the bridge, oh, you know, yeah. you made it sort of quite in your style and in your idiom, quite humorous, you know? Well, you know what? I, I mean, the guy that was with me, tall Chris, we're still mates. He's a chef now down in Wimbledon. A bit shorter, though. Yeah, a bit shorter. <laughs> but, like, tall Chris. I mean, that story about, you know, you know, lying on the floor being, with paramedics around, you know, being dragged out the car, but, you know, they had to cut the roof off the car to get us out. Jesus. Um, and they, then they put us in the same room together, you know, and they said, you know, we've we got to wait till you, you sober up, you know, before we can do anything, because and before we can give you any kind of pain relief. And we were sat there and all I could look, I kept looking at him and he'd, he'd hit the back of the seat. You know, he'd been on the back seat when we came to an abrupt halt, uh, as they would say. And uh, he, he just looked like Bart Simpson for some reason. His face was all over the place. <laughs> There was bits of bone hanging out of it. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, but it was really funny. Yeah. We wow. were alive. We yeah. were okay. We, I knew we'd be all right. And then, you know, years later, he's now, he looks like the Terminator, right? Oh, really? like all these, he's got all this kind of metal work in his arm, you know, right the way across. And, when, and he had to go to, uh, to uh, he's got a bit of arthritis in his arm now. This is over 20 years ago, obviously. Yeah. 93, my God. Is that um, what it was, 94? Yeah. Jesus. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, 93. Anyway, he's uh, he had to go back to the hospital to maybe have his screws tightened up a bit. And he, while he was there, he had a photograph done of it. And he put it on his Facebook page. And, his, and underneath, he put, this is what happens when you go out with Gary, Gary Shale. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so, you know, we still talk about it. And it's that, you know, the day you nearly died kind of syndrome. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I was, I, you know, they told me I wouldn't walk for, I think it was three or four months, and I was out of there in, in four days. You know, unbelievable. So, we totally digress now. Right, I want to get back to Ivan Novella Award. That came totally out of the blue. Um, that was the theme tune for Johnny Jarvis. Uh, and it was I mean, arranged. I, I mean, Ivan Novella Award. I mean, yeah, but at the time, you know, again, it was that thing. It, it, it's, you know, I didn't win, uh, which is a, which is a shame. But I was I was up in um, where was I? Leeds. I was up in Leeds doing a play called Trafford Tansy, uh, written by Claire Luckham and directed by Chris Bond. And I was at the Leeds Playhouse Theatre, and um, someone came in from the from the box office and said, "Oh, you've had a, some mail." And I was sat there and I opened it, and it was a letter from my agent with my nomination. Jeez. And I'd been nominated for best theme tune God. for a TV show. And who was who, who was you who was you up against? Uh, I think it, who was I up against? It, the theme from Valdivar, Valdivar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they won. Oh, actually. so it was categories. It's, it's not. Yeah, just, it's I, I don't know anything about the award. Yeah, yeah. It like, just you know, seems it's a, very regal to me. Yeah, it is. It's a great. It's like the Oscars of the music world. So, you know, and for me, it was brilliant because, you know, I'd been trying for ages that people take, you know, mu me being a musician seriously. So this really, for me, was like a little bit of a, there you go. You know what I mean? It's my membership, you know. Um, so I was very proud of that. I mean, I, you know, as I said, I never won it, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, came out the blue. Brilliant. But, you know, if, if it hadn't, again, I wrote it, but the guy who arranged it for, for TV is a guy called John Altman. Uh, not Nick Cotton, John Altman. Uh, John Altman, the music, you know, the Emmy Award winning producer. Um, and he was like, you know, the work he did with me when I was writing the music for that, you know, we worked with some amazing musicians. And he'd sit around my flat and, he, you know, he'd sit on the sofa and I was sat at the, the, the keyboard and I was playing it and singing it. And while I was doing it, he was writing all the dots. Gotcha. You know, as I was gotcha. doing it. So by the time we got to the studio, all the musicians were already there. Uh, and they, you know, they would play my music back to me. And it was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, God, oh, up until that moment, it had only been in my head. Yeah. And now you're hearing it. Yeah. You know, so really, he's the one who deserves, you know, the award for that. You know, because if it hadn't have been for him, it would still be in my head. Um, it's almost a schizophrenic existence that you've lived be uh, you know with where you, you're uh, battling in your soul between music and acting you know it's almost like the acting actually actually got in the way of what you what really wanted oh, to yeah. do you know it does and it still does um you know I, I mean i'm lucky enough to have a studio now and i, I mean i've written music for years now yeah. it's, it's not like you know it's, it's, it's not like a fad for 20 years, that's all I did. You know, I wrote music for films and TV. I worked with Ken Russell. Yeah. I wrote music for a film with him. I've written music for commercials, radio, plays, ballets. And a um, bit of dub so, for the Brixton boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I'm still doing that. I'm still working with a couple of those guys, you know, on, on other things. Um, and I've just finished an album of, of dance music. I wanted to do an album of dance music. Like the, the kind yeah, of I wanted to come to that just a little bit later, sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, but so I want, now I want to go right from Metal Mickey to sitting in Michael Caine's trailer smoking a cigar with him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on! I mean, Metal Mickey to sitting, <laughs> in, sitting in Michael Caine. That's a beautiful story with your great friend Lewis Collins as Lewis. well. You know? It's nice uh, to give him a shout, really. Oh yeah, what a great blow! I mean, I but how did that enough. come about? What? What? How did Jack the Ripper come how about? How did Jack the Ripper come about? That was because of a guy called uh, Peter Bryan. I don't know if you ever come across him. He's he's sadly passed them quite a while ago now. But Peter Bryan was a, a stunt director, legendary stunt director. Worked with John Wayne. Worked with Lee Marvin. Top bloke, and he was the stunt director on Quadrophenia. Right. And I wow. and and with my, I think it was I I'd, I'd, I'd been paid. I think I got paid, and I went out and bought a motorbike. Uh, and I had this little Yamaha, 
Uh, and I turned up for work um, up in Wembley or some nightclub or something. And he Is was this with Quadrophenia? Yeah. And I turned up and I was wheeling it, you know, like doing, like sliding it all over the place, being a bit of a flash twat. Anyway, um, I was quite handy on a motorbike. Um, and Pete saw it uh, and said, you know, would I like to uh, do maybe some stunt work? with his company and he had a company called the SAS, believe it or not. Wow. And they were called the Special Action Services. Anyway, I, he, he got me to sign up and my mum and dad had to help me sign the insurance forms because I was, on, I think I was just 18 or something. Uh, and at that point, I actually did become for a very short while, the youngest registered stuff manager. Wow. And I was like doing, and I went to stunt school. I learned to ride a horse and learned how to jump off clean, you know, buildings. buildings and all that crap. And it was just great fun, you know, like, um, anyway, so when uh, Jack the Ripper came along, it basically um, the director, David Wick, said that, you know, they wanted an actor to play Billy White, the pimp, uh, but they would like someone who could do, you know, all the fights. Um and I'd worked with Lewis Collins on The Professionals. I'd done an episode of The Professionals and we'd become good mates. Um, and Peter Braham was the stunt director for Jack the Ripper. He was and also the second assistant director doing all the stunt stuff. So he phoned me up and he, and he said, I know just the geezer. I, just know, I know the bloke. I know him. It's Gary Show. You've got to get him in. You've got to meet him. You've got to meet him. And I was out of work and I was married and, you know, the money wasn't coming in and I was sort of, still drinking like a couple of bottles of wine, you know, before like 11. Um, and I get this phone call. Um, and do you know what? I can't remember how I got the phone call because yeah. I didn't have mobile phones. But I drunk, drunk, probably. Yeah, yes. drunk, you know. But anyway, I get this phone call from Pete and he said, look, get up to London. I want you to meet this geezer. We're doing a film. I can't talk about it on the phone. It's all very hush-hush. Uh, anyway, I get on the bus, go up to town, walk in, and Pete Brown's there and he's like, hello, the big old Jewish kids where he was, a lovely man. And he's like, how are you? Are you all right? And all that. And I met David Wicks. And David said, um, Pete tells me you can fall downstairs and get thrown out of windows. <laughs> and you've got no worry about that. I said, none, none whatsoever. Uh, and that was it. That was my audition. And I came out of there. I went in there, like, with no money at all. And I came out of there and I was starring yeah, in a movie yeah, with Michael yeah, Caine and my yeah. mate Lewis Collins. You know, yeah. And that's how it works. Yeah. And how did you get on with him, Michael Caine? He was a, absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, he's such a, you know, what can you say? He's accessible, is he? Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, absolutely. But then they're, they're accessible as, of, of how you make it. I don't yes. know, I'm not quite sure. You know, I'd always be polite, you know, good morning. You know, if you've got a scene with someone, uh, you're going to have to run it through at some point. And that's when you really find out, you know, I have worked with actors in the past that are like, you know, uh, work with my standing. We don't, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or yeah. I'm doing this all in close up. So therefore yeah, I don't need yeah, to work yeah. with you. But he wasn't like that at all. And he, it was always one for the stories. He was telling stories all the time. Brilliant. And Brilliant. It was just a laugh. And also yeah. him and Lewis, him and Lewis had been working quite a while together on that film before I sort of had to, you know, before I came in. Um, so by the time I was sitting in the trailer, you know, with, with Lewis and when Michael came in, the first time I met him, Lewis was like, this is Gary, who I was telling you about. I know who Gary is. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I like mate, all right. But he's just like, and he's everything you want him to be, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's Michael Caine. He's Michael Caine, isn't he? He Michael blew Caine. the bloody doors up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so, so I was just like, Brilliant. Michael Caine. Fucking Michael Caine, mate. You know, and Susan George. I was like, I told Susan, Susan George, George for dogs. I've got exactly what you meant when you spoke about that. I know. In, in your book. I've yeah, got yeah. it exactly. That little scene on the sofa, right? Oh, my God. And all, I just kept looking at her and I thought, oh, my God. And she must have been, what, in maybe 32, 33 Gorgeous. when I was doing that film. And she was still drop dead, you know. But I had to tell her. I had to tell her. Of course. I had to say, you know, when I was 12, I was giving it large under the blanket. 
Well, how many people you reckon she's had that from? Well, absolutely. <laughs> not, not someone dressed up in 18th century costume. No, that's a, that's a, that's a novel. That's a, that's a novel. Eh? That, that, that does actually make the grade, that one. Yeah, I know. know. But yeah, so if it's like a dream come true when you're making movies like that. I mean, it was yeah. like a proper Hollywood film, you know. Yeah. Huge sets and, you know, and, and you know, horses and extras and... And everything else. Who and, done and it? Was Who done it? Who was the ripper? Um, well, no, they reckon in, in in that version that it was the Queen's gynaecologist, right. the Queen thing. But it's a, it's a load of bollocks because uh, it, recent research actually found out that he was about two hundred miles away when it was happening. Gotcha. But David Witch was absolutely convinced. Yeah. Uh, that it was him, but it wasn't. And no one really knows who it is. Yeah. And who oh, good. Um, I'm glad that you, you come out with that one. No one knows. Right. We go from Michael Caine and, and Jack the Ripper to, uh, fuck it, I've had enough of this. I'm getting out of it. Oh, what? Leaving? Just stopping it? Just yeah. bit the acting. Oh. Acting. And then yeah. actually step in again without too much effort into a an enterprise in commercial jingle writing thing that yeah, took that, you to again, Dubai, that took you to sort of, the, and, 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 and got you on your feet again. And yeah, then the drugs it, and the alcohol, I suppose, got a little bit worse at that time. Well, or better, depending on which or way better, you better, yeah. Uh, you know, the, my, you know my, my class of vodka went up, definitely. I stopped drinking the cheap shit. Um, but so no, you give up acting, you give up acting, you're potless, you're drunk, you, you like a bit of gear every now and then, all of a sudden, how do you get to become rich again? Right, I'll tell you. When I was, well, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to act anymore. I just, I got bored of it. And, and also, I, the only stuff I was getting offered was like soaps, um, you know, EastEnders. And, 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 and it wasn't me. And, and, I, and the thing is, I like doing... I don't know about you, Eddie, but you know the best part of doing a new play is the, the first day and the last day. Yes. Right? All of the stuff in between is just Absolutely. like work. But I love the first day meeting everybody and I love the first day of rehearsal and I love the last night. Everything else is like, so it's that, for me, it's that immediate moment. That's why I like filming. You can get, if you get a scene right, it's done and you yeah. move on. Um, so the idea of being in a long TV show, long running TV show, just didn't appeal to me at all well and you've also, done that anyway didn't you had three years in in metal mickey yeah yeah but that, don't forget it wasn't like three solid years i only had like 13 weeks a year right you know you and, and then you got the rest of the time to swan around at the nightclubs being a tv personality you know I yeah mean, but, but uh, what i mean is is people were still calling you by that character in metal mickey yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that didn't stop me doing other stuff. I mean, even when I was doing Metal Mickey, I still did give my regards to Broad Street with McCartney and I still did The Professionals. See what I, I still... mean? There's so much to say. I mean, I'm yeah, I know. But the... Even during Metal Mickey, I did I did the film with McCartney. I did The Professionals. I did Casualty. How'd that come about, the Paul McCartney one? I mean, blimey, that That's was me. Bit... And you, you, you know, meeting Linda and Paul McCartney. And yeah. also... The super band they put together. So how did all that come about? Is that's because his kids were fans of Metal Mickey? Unbelievable. I used to watch it, at, you know, every Saturday, like millions of others. Um, and I think what it was is that uh, Heather McCartney, who was his, who was his daughter, uh, who was Linda's daughter, um, she was a huge fan. Um, and I think really they got me in to cheer her up. Right. Um, uh, and. And that was it. I mean, you know, getting a phone call from Paul McCartney and thinking, I thought it was my mate Pete taking the picture. Gotcha. He used to phone up and say, uh, uh, I, hello, he'd, he'd leave a message at my mum's house. And one day I came home and he said, uh, my mum said, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Lion has phoned. He's a casting director, Mr. Lion. Can you bring him back? So I went, oh, all right. I phoned up and it was some kind of London Zoo. <laughs> And I'm asking for Mr. Lion. <laughs> oh, that's a cool... <laughs> that's a cool... <laughs> mate. 
As a talker. <laughs> but I know. So whenever I used to get a message, I'd say, hey, I bet it's Pete, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it up. It wasn't. It was actually, it really was Paul McCartney. And I went up to um, Pinewood on my little motorbike and uh, and him and Linda came out and uh, we went and had lunch and uh, that was it. Wow. And I was in. And that, yeah. it was, again, it's only one scene in the movie, but it took, but I was on that set for like three weeks. You know, it's uh, iconic. I mean, it's Paul McCartney. It's a movie made by Paul McCartney. Yeah, and yeah, he absolutely. Got his in as well, didn't he, to play the band? I bet he was in Evan there as well, wasn't he? Oh, it was just a joy. You know, you know, just the people, Dave Edmonds and Chris Spedding, Ringo Starr. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and it's just like you, it's like going and people say, you know, have you got to work in the morning? And you go, if you can call it that. You know, I mean, it yeah. was just like, it was did just you, like heaven. Did you wind up having a little jam or did you pick an instrument? Oh, God, yeah. You did. Yeah, yeah, try and keep, there's a, I've got a lovely photo that I didn't know, I just, to this day, I don't know who took it. But, um, you know, I was playing, the, the, there was some pianos on stage and at one lunchtime I just started playing and Paul McCartney come, came up behind me and started playing, we doing a little duet and someone wow. got a photo of that. I've got a photo of that. Wow. Uh, and I'm really glad I have because it's the only phone. You know, we didn't have mobile phones. In yeah, there. Carl, what would um, you get for a mobile phone then, mate? Yeah, I know, but then again, no, you know, no. Then you lose the the beauty of it. Don't absolutely, you know. So no, there's a lot. I'm glad I, we didn't have all that then. You know, it sort of cheapens it now. You people go, oh, look at these photos. You yeah, and on you go. Um, but no, I mean, it was an amazing experience. You know, yeah. absolutely amazing. Um, and again, it's just that whole thing of. You know, you find yourself in in the company of legends, and or people who are perceived as being legendary. That's the thing. And then when you actually get to chat to them, you find out that they're, they're not that they're, they're nice people. Then you know they're they're all right. You know, and that they're not up their own ass. You know, and they've got every right to be if they really want to be. You know, I mean, if if Michael Caine had been a twat or if Paul McCartney had been a twat to me, it would be too easy to use that as a story to hang on to. For rest of my life it's, yeah. oh Paul McCartney he's the right wanker yeah you know, no he's not he's a really nice guy and yeah. I'm sorry if that's boring no, but that's brilliant. what he is brilliant yeah really really brilliant I mean look we're coming to the end of it all now so but I, well, what I really wanted to touch on touch on because I'm sort of in the same boat as you anyway and and, and maintaining the I mean I know it's easy a lot easier now than when it was but I mean, what what re was it? Was it wanting to live that made you give up alcohol and become a, and go to AA? Because I love the AA stories. I, I mean, I, I wrote one of myself in an AA story, you know. And we know how we get that to get to that point where we have to give up alcohol. And when you give up alcohol, did your life become better, or did you wish? Always had it in the back of your mind. Oh, I could go and have a drink. I could do this. I can do that again. Or do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. For me, it was a medical thing. I mean, it just wasn't working anymore. You know what I mean? It wasn't working anymore. Um, I didn't get the pleasure of it anymore. And also, uh, you know, uh, society changed. You know, um, you know, and, and everything about it suddenly it it just didn't have that glamour that I used to associate with it. Uh, and it was like, you know, and I, funny enough, you know, I, it, it, I, I think I touch on it in the book, but from the moment that I did, and this is the thing, I thought like a load of idiots that I could just stop drinking. I thought I could just stop drinking. That's how easy it would be. And it wasn't. And from the moment I decided to stop drinking, it took me close on 15 years. Yeah. 15 yeah. long years to battle it to the point yeah. where I can honestly say now I don't drink. I don't drink, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so so and I don't do this. You know, when people say oh, I haven't had a drink for six hundred and fifty three thousand days and twelve minutes, I can't I don't, you know what I mean? I'm you not, haven't I, had a drink today. I haven't had a drink today. I look on it this if I can go to bed tonight without having a drink, it's been a successful day. But yeah. I don't agonize over it. I don't yeah. sit here going Oh my God, I've got to pray or I've got to thank someone. I know, that, that got me out of that AA, you know. I couldn't, that, I couldn't that cope stuff, with that. It, it got me out of it. I've, it, it, 
I mean, it, it's great when you talk about Bill and Bob's book, you know? Yeah, the, yeah, the big, the, the the big book. book. I understand that and all that, but I find it a little bit too creepy at times, you know? Yeah, I agree. And But I also think, you know, whatever works for you. you yeah. Know, if, 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 you know, I had a good doctor. Believe it's me, a good I'm start, moving. Gary. I, I'm not knocking it. I mean, no, it's neither. a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And it is truly a lifesaver. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. It's just not for me. I'm not a great one for joining clubs. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I just thought, no, you know, I'm going to try the medical route. See how that works, and it worked. It the worked. For me. Yeah, it worked. Uh, you know, it didn't work for George Best. It yeah. didn't work for a lot of other people, uh, but for me, it worked. And, and are it, they still around? These little pills, Gary. Yeah, you can still get them. But you know, they, this is the thing that annoys me. Is like, you know, they do work, um, and that you know, uh, from a medical point of view, because they physically stop you drinking. You can't drink alcohol. You can't even wear aftershave. Oh, really? If you're on these pills, you know, you come, it makes you allergic. It makes you allergic to alcohol. Wow. And that's what I needed. Brilliant. I needed that. I needed someone to put a gun to my head. You know what I mean? Because I love drinking. I love it. Um, and, but as I say, I, you know, now things are different. But you, sort of, different. you sort of get a, because there's another bit in your book when you talk about when your little white pills run out and as soon as they run out, bosh, off you go again. Yeah, well, that, again, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, and I think you get into that whole thing of, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, recently, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I tried all the old, um, the uh, alcohol free option. Oh. You know, like, and they were shit, right? Horrible. But then, only the other week, I discovered um, a, 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 a non-alcoholic lager by like Peroni or, or what, you know one of the good makes, and yeah. I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. Yeah, and it's really it nice, works. brilliant, and it works. And the thing is, it, it's it's not replacing beer, but it gives me that kind of I satisfaction. Why should you give yourself what well, you know when there's an alternative? Why should Absolutely. you? Why should you be so hung up on it? I mean, I think the thing about sort of AA and all that, it creates this sort of real guilt. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. And it's a beautiful thing that it saves people's lives. I, I personally, I couldn't get past step four, you know? I, I no, mean, I know. That's the one that done me. Well, so. the one that done me, and I can't remember what step it is, is the one where you have to apologise to everybody for fucking them off, right? And I was like, well, actually, there's quite a few people that deserved it. You exactly, know what I mean? Mate. I'm not exactly. saying sorry. I'm sorry about that. But, I, didn't like the, I didn't like the one where you had to write everything down. I thought, <laughs> yeah. I had grass in myself. I lose, I'll lose that letter. Yeah, I know. Somewhere around the house. Yeah, I know. I know what a twat I am. I don't have to remind <laughs> myself every day. You know what I mean? Right. Logic. Oh, logic. Logical. Yeah, no, that's... Logical. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Me. No, I started that about a year ago. Um, well, you know, we we did To Be Someone, the movie yeah. that's coming out next week. Well, is it coming out next week? Is it definitely think, coming out next yeah, week? Yeah, apparently so. I spoke, to, I spoke to Ray Burdis yesterday. And oh, he did said, you? Uh, it's coming out on the 9th. Oh, brilliant. 9th of yeah, July. Just so. before the, in case no one knows about this, this is a little mod film that, well, I don't know if it's a mod film, a little caper that we shot two years ago and well, I don't know how to put this you know loosely based on an iconic movie sort of thing with the original cast like yourself Leslie Ash Toya uh, Trevor, Mark. Trevor Mark we're all in it I mean but it's nothing to do with Quadrophenia I think the, the, the reason was it was a, a good excuse to get us all back together of for course. a movie and it makes good copy it makes good of copy see and I think that will help a long Have way. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. No, I haven't seen it. And, and you know, after two years, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm pretty good at moving on. Do you know, I've got a, a shelf in there with movies on DVD that I'm in that I've never seen. Yeah. Uh, it's not really my kind of thing. Once they're done, they're done. Yeah. And I've I'm on to the next films thing. I've never seen, you know. Just... Yeah, I know. People tell me it's good and people tell me it's shit. And I don't know because I've not seen it. Um, it's not my interest, but uh, yeah, no, I think I mean, from what I've heard, I don't know anybody who's seen it yet. 
Yeah. You know, so I haven't heard any news at all. I'm hoping it's going to be good. And when we were making it, it seemed to be quite good and, and it's quite funny. So let's hope it is. Yeah, touch wood. Touch wood. Logical. Yeah, is no, it, what uh, I was going to say was... Is this, is this your... I know you're going to go on making music until sort of day zero, until, oh, yeah. until the last moment of your... And, and and what is the reason for this? Because I, I think it's beautiful. I, I think, you know, I was so impressed with it. Although I read your book, I don't know you as a musician or anything. And uh, it's very uh, competent and very... Uh, it's a bit of class, actually. I, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of music from a mixture of eras, you know? That was the point. I mean, you know, I've written music for all it. You know, I can write, you know, anything, really. Uh, well, yeah, literally anything, any kind of style of music. Uh, but when I did, I, a year ago, when I bought the, the, the equipment I wanted, and I'm, now I live in Dorset, we had the, I moved into a place which had the room to build a studio. So I, I used the money I earned from to be someone right. to, build, to build the studio. Fuck um, me, you got paid a few quid. I'll well, actually, you'd be surprised. I know, you'd be surprised, right? It, it, you know, it, was a, it, it, it wasn't as much as you think, but uh, yeah. it was enough to do what I wanted. You yeah. Know? Um, and, I've, you know, I advertised to some musicians locally and some brass players, and, and I started recording, really. I didn't know what it was going to be like. And, 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 and then all of a sudden, I suddenly thought, you know what, I really fancy, you know, back in the people, you know, always slate off like the, you know, the 80s dance music and 90s dance music as being, you know, that like kind of house music and being trash and all that. And I was suddenly saw on YouTube and, and things like that, this music being being celebrated again, you know, and there was some, some amazing tunes that, that, that became part of that era that, that people still play and go, oh, yeah. I love that record, I love that record. The I funky love sort of bits of it. Yeah, funky stuff. And I thought, I'm going to... And, and, and the dance music combined with the funk, you know? Absolutely. So so I, I wanted to give that a, a, a crack, a crack really. Uh, and I've so I've done that. And it's interesting because, you know, it's, again, it takes on a life of itself. And, and, uh, and I've really enjoyed it, but it's done, you know. Yeah. I think I've got about, on the album, I think there's about 12 songs now, 12 tracks. Uh, and you could put it on at, at, at any party now. And that would take you through. It's like, is it for sale DJ. anywhere, Gary? Is it for sale anywhere? Not yet. Well, you, you are going to give it a go, though, and you you ain't going to just lock it away because no, I'm not going to lock it away. But what I've done is I've started adding them up on my YouTube channel. If anyone wants to go to my YouTube channel, it's Gary Shell YouTube. You can find them there. And the thing is that I've been looking on Facebook, and absolutely everybody's got you know my new album, my new album, my new album, my new album. And, 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 you know, they're selling it for like, you know, uh, it's on iTunes or it's on yeah. Spotify and they're giving it away. You know, it's like you know, my new album. But, but the, you know, and I'm not knocking it. But anyone who can make music is OK by me. Yes. And, but most of the people that I'm seeing, are, 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 they've got day jobs. It's like, you know, I work yeah. all day in a factory and at weekends I play in a tribute band. And it's like, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm Which not is knocking a good it. thing, but... It's a good thing, but what I'm saying is it's not what they do for a living. It's not yes. what you do for a living. It's like people go, ah, you're an actor, I'm an actor. And I go, oh, really? No. And it's like, yeah, well, I'm working at McDonald's. And I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, but don't turn around and tell me you're an actor while I'm trying to buy a cheeseburger. And also, <laughs> yeah, that's a good line, that is, actually. But you know what I mean? And, and yeah. it's like, I'm not knocking it. If you and I think it's also, I think what I've found these days... It takes away all that, all them dues that you've had, that you have to pay. Yeah, you, know, I'm, I'm, yeah. That you have to pay of being, especially going back to sort of I got into it late eighties sort of thing. So, and I mean the equity card was something that just absolutely drove me insane. You know, I, I, I had to, I had to uh, well, work so hard standing in pubs with a guitar and singing. yeah, yeah, to get the contracts and get get your 40 weeks i know i know but now it's you know you know you you need a high definition mobile phone with a camera on it and you could be an actor yeah I mean, you know as i say it's a different world and the music industry is no different it's a completely different world to the one that i grew up with um 
So to be honest, I'm not going to advertise my new album and, you know, and get it printed on CD and have boxes of CDs in the vain hope that someone wants to spend some money on it. No, if you want to hear it, you can find it if you want. Mm. But I'm not going to ram it down people's throats. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, and it's not the reason I'd do it. If I, was, if I wanted to make, you know, money out of music, it wouldn't be doing this, trust no, me. No, of course. I could write 30 it's seconds of a TV commercial for dog food and earn more money. Yeah. Um, so, so really, it's a, it's a love of my life, music. Yeah. I, it's I everything sort of all come together sort of thing. Like, yeah, and it is I nice. I suppose you could have written this 20 years ago, could you? No, not at all. It's, it's very much in retrospect. It, but what I love is some of the comments I get, you know, from people that have actually searched it out and listened to it. And they say, you know what? That reminds me of a summer I had back in 1984 yeah. when I was in Ibiza. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's what I want is for you to hear it and it throw you back to a time, you know. And it's like, but the next album I do, I mean, I've, I did an album recently with a guy um, who lives in Dorset, who's like a bit of a local face, um, you know, in the folk scene. He's like a folk musician, a guy called Bronco Hutchins, lovely bloke. And uh, I did his solo album and it's folk music. But like what I did is I, on a couple of the tracks, I've made it like folk music meets dub music. Uh, and I've done a kind of dance version of some classic Irish jig music and yeah, stuff like that. Brilliant. Brilliant. And it's so, it's, so I'm getting to work with different musicians and putting different ideas together. So there's lots of other things. And it's, having the studio means I can work whenever I want. Of course. Of course. Um, so, you know, I'll and never... You're not, and you're not caught up in this <laughs> sort of, I've got to be an actor bullshit and I've got to get a job and I've got... Oh, God, no. Of everyone, I know you're not caught up in all that. So it sounds to me like... Life is really good for you at the moment, mate. It is. It's, it's it, you know, actually, considering, you know, the times we're living in, I'm, I'm very lucky, you know. Um, you know, you know, everybody sort of knows if you look at my, you know, social media, everyone knows how I feel about this, the, what's going on at the moment. Uh, we all to feel, be honest, mate, it's a liberty, mate, yeah. absolutely. And, and we purposely not got involved in all that. But no, and I don't want to, and I'm not going know to. What anyone thinks? Go on Facebook and see what you know. Yeah, if you, you want, want to know what I think about it, I'm I'm quite open about it, and I'll debate it with anybody. But the, but the point being is, I'm not letting that determine what it is I do in my life. Yeah. Um. And you know, I I was offered, a, I've been offered a, a couple of days on a movie, and it's it's a documentary, it's a spoof documentary about the Anglican Church. Brilliant. And I read the script, and it made well, me laugh so it. much. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and they've had to put filming back because of this shit, what's going on. And, and, and that's the first time it's actually affected me uh, was that, you know, I was supposed to start filming next Saturday. And because of um, the, com the concerns of one of the cast members, uh, it's had to be, you know, put, postponed. And it, that's the first time. And I, and I said, I couldn't believe actually how fucking annoyed I was. Yes. Now, hang on a minute. That's, so it's the first time in almost two years that it's actually affected me. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I yeah. thought, right, I'm not going to get affected by it again, you know. And if I want to yeah. make music, no one can tell me I can't. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as I say, I don't, I've never been one for hanging out in restaurants and pubs, you know. So that hasn't affected me. Yeah, well, um, lately you ain't, but years ago you loved Oh, it. yeah, no, God almighty, but, you know, yeah. but... But uh, at the moment, no, I'm, I'm quite happy and uh, content. That's so wonderful, mate. Right, we can go on forever and ever oh, and yeah. ever and ever and ever and make this into a sort of once upon a time in America sort of. <laughs> Great movie. Little turn out. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave it here now, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure, Eddie. Something, Gary, just... So much respect, you know, to you for to where you've been. Uh, for being alive, to, yeah, for staying alive. Just being alive, really. And yeah. if anyone sort of gets a bit of time on their hands and they work, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it on Amazon. You can yeah, I think, that, I think that it, I think there's going to be a new rerun of it. Uh, Fantastic. It. Uh, I'll let people know. But it's but called, I, I think it's available on Kindle. What's that? I'm still on the guest list. Yeah, it's called I Think I'm on the guest list. I think I'm <laughs> Yeah, I'm not on the guest list anymore, darling. 
I think I'm on the guest list. Sorry, I, look, you would think I would have known that because I've just been, <laughs> my head's been in it for a solid week, sort of thing, reading it. But it's it's a powerful uh, testament on a on a creative man's life, you know. And it's it's the read is just every actor should read it. Everybody that thinks. You know, Gary's just mod Quadrophenia should read it. It's it, it's beautiful. It's it's sad. It's funny, and it's truthful. So all I can say is really, Gary, thank you so much. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. My first. Yes, ever, I am honoured. I am yes, honoured. On yeah. a podcast. <laughs> yeah, you can make sure this goes out first. I, I, I will have a look at it. At Carol Harrison. Just yeah. tell Carol. You are the first and the only, mate. And if you Brilliant. if you want to, like Gary said, we've got some beautiful sort of guests coming up on his podcast. We've got Carol Harrison. Ah, oh, she's Ed, wonderful. You know, as we we all know. So, you know, please subscribe to the You've Been Webbered YouTube podcast channel. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Whatever. Whatever it is, because apparently, I'm told, subscribers are the new sort of cocaine, you know? So Yeah. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Gary. And, uh, My pleasure, mate. And, and, and hopefully we'll be able to sit down and watch this to be someone soon. And please listen to Gary's music. Yeah, if you want to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loading it up gradually. I put a couple on yesterday. So by the end of the month, there should be about 20, 25 tr new tracks on my YouTube channel. And, and they're, they're there for you to listen to or you can share or download and whatever. And they're, it's absolutely free. I'll if put the link in this description anyway, Gary. Once yeah. you put this out, I'll have all your links down and whatever you want to do sort of thing. And uh, so really, you've been webbed, son. Ah, I've been webbed. <laughs>